Put your heart and mind to it, I think anybody can achieve anything, so, yep. My name is Malcolm Lawrence, I'm from Palm Island, um, born and raised there. Um, yeah, uh, just one of the youth workers here um, at Yeti. Oh, I started about three years ago now, in 2011. And the reason I like coming into Yeti is probably see a lot of positive outcomes from everyone who attend their service and being able to help in their lives as much as possible and probably positive change in their life. So, yep. I guess it all comes back from past experience, being brought up where I have been. Um, yeah, we didn't um, have much where I come from and being able to use that past experience as a motivation every day is probably one of the big things. And everyone has a different walk of life, but um, yeah, just having that background, relating to people um, and basically going through what they did as well. So there are not a lot of Indigenous uh, youth workers in the system and being able to for the, for the kids to come in and see that and say, look, oh, if, if he's there, I can do that as well. So, yeah, every single person here always come in and um, very helpful, very positive going kids and, um, yeah, it's good to see young people being active, I guess. Yeah, that helps coming every day a lot more when you see them happy and the biggest thing that I've learnt is the only thing stopping you is you. Um, and if you put your heart and mind to it, I think anybody can achieve anything, so. My grandfather was a man of strength, courage and bravery, and that is why he is my hero. After fighting his cancer for many years, he passed away in 2009. He was a man who made time for everyone, especially me, as he raised me as his own son, and I honestly think that I would be the complete opposite to who I am today if it wasn't for him. Yeah, he was a pretty big inspiration in my life. I'm pretty much just like my grandfather, I'm a gentle giant. Um, He's always taught me violence is not the answer to anything. A really big lesson that my grandfather taught me was that if you really put your mind to it, you can do anything. I wanted to find out more about the life he led before I was born, so I visited my auntie and asked her some questions. He was a type of man who was very, very soft-hearted. He was the type of man that would give his last dollar to whoever needed it. Um, he didn't have anything nasty to say about anybody. And growing up with that um, just made you feel um, the love for him was very strong. It was just wonderful growing up with him. He was like um, a gentle giant, you know, and whatever any child would want, he would give. You know, some, somehow they would get round and um, He'd um, give them what they, they wanted, you know. So he was a big softy. The love and respect that he had for family is what he's passed on, is because he, that was a big thing to him. And I see it now where he's passed it on to everybody else. It's just the love, the love for everybody. When it came to violence, it was he was a no. Like he did not like violence at all, but he was not one to attack. He never retaliated and he was never a fighter. You know, and that was the one thing, you know, that stood out with Poppy was that whenever we seen Kenny, you know, you were always there. You know, you're always by by your Poppy's side. We'd go to parties and you and Poppy would be there. You were very close you and Poppy, very close. And that was a big part that, you know, that you lost. He was a big mentor. Um, to all his nieces and nephew, you could see that. Even his brothers and sisters, we all looked up to him, you know, because he was such a placid man. But if anyone took his last piece of cake, 
they were in trouble. I miss that friendship and company where I could just ring him anytime and you know just talk to him about anything or even you know if we want to play basketball you know he would be the first to say yeah come on let's go you know, and I miss all that where whenever we do go somebody's missing. Now that he's gone I feel that he's always with me and that with each lesson that I've learned from him will be the ones that I'll pass down to the next generation. My mum is my hero because we've both been through the same troubles, only different and on a different level. She always tells the story of how us three girls saved her life. I wouldn't trade her for the world, nor would I change how everything has turned out. My name is Maureen Sweeney. I was born here in Cairns. Here in Cairns, it was pretty deadly. It was a lot better than now. I went to um, Cairns Central State School. That was the first primary school in Cairns. Apart from the hidden racism, everybody was just the same. We didn't sort of discriminate amongst ourselves. I think one of the main things was trying to get work in Cairns. Uh, I remember applying for one job when I was about 17. Went and applied for this job and I was very bluntly told, oh, the owner doesn't want blacks working for them. And that was at the Compass Motel, used to be next door to Shenanigans. That I never worried about it. I went to Cairns Business College after high school. I enjoyed my life growing up here in Cairns. One, the employment rate was very low. Like, there was no employment here unless you had money and you knew how to sew and cook, you know, and then you can go and work for people. Um, but I wasn't going to do that. I went to college to better myself. And I got my diploma in secretarial practices and then I applied for jobs of course there was nothing then I went and worked for back then Social Security which is now Centrelink I worked for them in the typing pool and that was only on a traineeship and then after that I joined the Army Reserves and spent a year in the Army Reserves went out bush with them I ended up applying for a job with the public service and I worked at Laverack Barracks for seven years. Couldn't handle that anymore, didn't like the way women in general, black women, the way that they treated them. So then I did voluntary work with the Aboriginal media in Townsville, 4K1G. And then I worked with the Aboriginal Torres Strait Islanders mental health down there in Townsville. And yeah, I had, during that time I had my two older girls. Um, I did a lot of protesting down there with um, the media. I did a lot of stuff for NAIDOC, and Festival of Pacific Arts and all that sort of stuff. So it was just all voluntary work that I'd done. Found out I was pregnant with my third daughter. At that time I was studying at JCU, doing my bridging course. And during that time when I was doing my bridging course, I did my intensive pre-law um, course and the exams for that it was myself and another Torres Strait lady she topped the highest across Australia for the exams like the results and I got second highest um, then we went down to Townsville and did our intensive pre-law course down there for six weeks I got a HD for the overall course but I never stayed there I came out of uni I finished my studies there um, after I had the my last one and then I stayed at home for a little while and then got a job working with EQ full time. Next year on, in April makes 15 years I've been working in this job. I asked my mum if she had any troubles growing up. I was surprised to hear her response. Oh no, it was a rage. I had a good time. <laughs> you know, I had a good time when I didn't have children. Then I had children I slowed down. But yeah, um, that was good. We talked about seeing herself as a mentor. 
I think I'm, in a way, a mentor. I mean, I have a lot of, like all three of you girls have looked up to me as your mentor. Um, I think part of being that mentor was teaching you to be strong. And that's just the way I was. I made you go out and do things for yourselves. Like, so I made you to be very independent. Like other students in the school, they listen to me, they um, take my advice and that. So yeah, I suppose in a way I'm a mentor. I was scared when I first met your mum, because she's just, she looks scary. She's a mentor to me because I know she, she doesn't really care about what other people say. She's always there. She's, she, when you need help, she's there. You know, you can ring her, call her, ring her, call her, the same thing. She helped me a few weeks ago. I got locked out of my hotel room, so she um, let me bunk in with her. Yeah. Hi, Maureen, if you're watching, I love you heaps. When you're out there, you know, when you get older and you're out there, you know, just like the leadership thing says, you know, aim for the stars, but, yeah, just keep on doing what you're doing and just do it even better. After the interview, I wanted to thank my mum and let her know, even though I'm not an angel, I do appreciate everything she's done for me. I have put you through her life. Yeah, a lot more than the other two. What are you trying to say? Anyway, go. No, but I have, and you still, you're still there, and you put me back on the right track. Like, because after you did that, I realised you were bending over backwards for me. And still today? Yeah, that's a different story. No. <laughs> but yeah, that's true. No. Thank you for that, Mum. Thank you, Mum. The Thank first you. pain is mine. Oh, my <laughs> God. <laughs> you want to give me a hug? No. Quick, give me a hug. Quick. <coughs> Just quick, Mum, quick. My grandfather has been a big part of my life since I was born. Having spent a lot of time with him growing up, I've come to know him as a pun-loving, riddle-telling, compassionate and caring man who is always up to spinning a good story. But there's a side to his own story that I'm not so familiar with. It's a story that has taken me on a journey of tragedy, faith and self-worth. This is my granddad's deadly story. Um, my name is... Uh... William Alec Hollingsworth, um, known by many as Pastor Bill or um, Uncle Bill. Uh, Eighty and a half years old, um, born in Mossman, uh, but spent most of my life in the Cairns in the Swell area. Well, as I said, I was born in Mossman and um, in 1933, out in the sticks, as it were, in Mayello, there was um, mother and father and three sons at that time uh, when I was born, and then Frank um, arrived a couple of years later, and then Bob later on still. Uh, but we grew up out in the bush and uh, spent most of our lives out there, really went into town except, uh, well I didn't remember anyway, but uh, my mother used to, I was very sick as a child and uh, she'd spend a lot of time taking me in and out of hospital or leaving me there. And my childhood was such that uh, the doctors thought uh, and told her that it's probable that I wouldn't live to more than 12 years of age. Uh, so I had the pleasure 
on my 80th birthday of going back to the Mossman Hospital and, and observing the labour room and, and everything where I was born. And, and they gave me a tour of the hospital in a wheelchair this time. Uh, so it was uh, from the cradle to the wheelchair. But uh, it was a, an amazing experience. In 1940, when the war broke out and things got a bit close to home, uh, we shifted down to Cairns, uh, onto Bavinda, Harvey Creek area. Went to school at uh, McDonald Creek and then uh, shifted into Cairns. Went to school at Parramatta, lived in the bungalow area. And uh, it was during that time that um, my father caught a rail motor to Babinda, supposedly to, to do some uh, cooking for a, for a gang of cane cutters out there. And uh, unfortunately, um, things didn't turn out the way they were anticipated. They were at the railway crossing. There's a shop there in Babinda, if you know the area. They went to the shop when the rail motor pulled out from the station. So they raced across to j try and jump on the uh, running board of the rail motor. Um, the other chap made it, but Dad didn't. Uh, he slipped and went under the wheels and had both his legs chopped off. So. Um, and he passed away that night in the hospital. So that left uh, mum with five boys and, uh, and um, no income. Myself, I, because of our moving around and the loss of father and, and so on, I only reached grade five in primary. That was about the limit of my formal education. But in spite of that, I think I've done pretty well, uh, been able to um, go out and, and, and work in the um, wider world. I've worked on the railway a fair bit. I'd worked down here on the low coast most of the time, but then uh, we were shifted up to Coranda. And um, when I told them I was, I was shifting up to Coranda, a lady said to me, she said, you watch out for Ruth Brim up there when you go up. She'll be liable to catch you. And eventually she did. I attribute my uh, being blessed in that because of my faith in Jesus Christ. He's my saviour and Lord. And, and I count that as the greatest event that's happened in my life. And uh, married to Ruth is... Uh, the second 54 years of marriage, and, uh, uh, seven children. Uh, unfortunately, we lost two boys, um, but uh, still we've had a, a very good life, I believe. Yeah, I suppose people find this hard to believe, you know, but I, I still have to, to share it because it's a part of my life. I believe the Lord spoke to me and said, sit down for 12 months. I said, well, that's a tall order because I've got a wife and seven kids and, and I've got a house to rent to pay and a car to pay off and, and all these sorts of things. So I was then moved to go to the, the Bible and see what King David had to say. And he said, once I was young and now I'm old, yet I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. So I said, OK, I'll do it. You know, for 12 months, I had no work, but every need was supplied. It was like living on, uh, on razor's edge or, or whatnot, but that was what I experienced. But I was offered a job with alcohol rehabilitation. So I went into that then, started working with uh, rehabilitating alcoholics at the um, AIARS. Now that went on for three years. And at the end of three years, the National Aboriginal Conference elections came up. And a friend of mine <coughs> said to me, Bill, why don't you um, nominate 
to the NAC and I brushed it off as a joke. Well, Elia Ware and uh, his daughter Grace, they were convinced that I should go. And so a week before the election, they nominated me and I got elected. So uh, that then uh, started me on a, on a different course. Because I'd only gone to grade five in primary school, you know, I'd, um, it appeared that uh, I wouldn't be able to achieve much in life unless I had a, a higher education. I believe in creation and uh, that God never made junk. And if he said he made us in his image, then we all have the capacity to do whatever uh, God has appointed us to be capable of doing. And so that was my belief that I could still do things, that whether I had an edu formal education or not.